Season 6 was marketed as the biggest content release to Overwatch 2 since release. But how good is it really? Well, it's complicated, seeing as it's been downscaled so much. To be fair to the devs, I do prefer the live service model. I'm on board for them making iterative changes over time. So I think while I have some negative things to say, I mostly have good things. And thanks to the live service model, the things I'm worried about, I'm sure that in the next iterations, they can improve. Which is probably better than Blizzard going away for 10 years to make a game that they eventually cancel. I'm happy to have something when it comes to the story mode, because I always felt it was the most underutilized part of the game. But I'm gonna have to spoil the ending of this video for you and tell you that I am not big on the story mode for Overwatch 2 Invasion. Everyone was worried that it was going to be Archives Plus. I want to call it Archives Minus, because I actually think it's worse on balance than the free PvE quote-unquote content that we got in Overwatch 1. Ultimately, I think a lot of the confusion has come through based on different expectations of what that term means, and having a lot of discussions with viewers and other creators, I can pinpoint it to understand it like this. When it was sold as a full PvE game, as Jeff said in multiple times, similar to Diablo Adventure Mode, there are certain expectations that come with it. There also is like free horde-based PvE content that we got in Overwatch 1, but if it was marketed as more of that, I don't think it nearly would have gotten the anticipation that it had been building up. And Blizzard likes to play fast and loose with that terminology, switching between the two as as if a full release game and the free rink-a-dink modes that they added to Overwatch 1 were the same thing, and we always knew they weren't. In actuality, I was much more happy with Archives than I am with Invasion, because the little extra rink-a-dink modes actually had a sparkle of polish on them, and they didn't overstay their welcome, they didn't suffer from scope creep, they were reasonably sized and actually like a pretty tight experience. In fact, I'd say the enemy variety and AI was better than it seems to be in the paid mode. Huh? How did that happen? I really wanted the story mode to be good. I think it can get better over time, thankfully to the live service version of the game. So I want to focus on the good aspects of the invasion story mode, and hopefully they can emphasize those later. They're building up Ramatra to be quite an interesting character, and I think this story will feel more complex compelling once the big bad really starts going. He's powerful and menacing and will be a worthy adversary for our Overwatch heroes to overcome, but barely in the introduction so far. I think the devs did a really good job with the difficulty scaling. As you go up the difficulty curve, you're really going to have to think more critically about your team composition. Certain heroes will need to have key interactions against the elites for you to stand a chance. And while I'll have some criticisms about the gameplay mechanics themselves, the fact that we have to sort of have a meta team comp theory craft about which heroes are better suited to deal with this difficult challenge, that's a big part of the fun of Overwatch and something I hope that they emphasize more in the future. For example, the Stalkers are quite annoying and much more oppressive than they are in Left 4 Dead, where the mechanic was taken from, more or less. Because in Left 4 Dead, everybody's got a melee that can kind of get an enemy off of you. But in Overwatch, that really only applies to a few heroes. And if you don't have a Brigitte or Reinhardt, you sort of just get sucked in and die to them. Other things are surprisingly useful. For example, you can use a May Wall to block the line of sight of a subjugator as it comes onto your Omnic civilians. There's some creative things that the heroes can do, but not all of them have that, and it just seems to be something that's like heavily underutilized in the game mechanics, because unlike Left 4 Dead, a game where all of the mechanics are synergistic and built from the ground up, we're oftentimes dealing with heroes that are built for PvP, and although they try to rework some of the abilities, like Speed Amp for Lucio increases your fire rate, and Winston's alternate fire will chain to multiple enemies, there's things like like this that they've done to try to smooth it over, but for the most part, there are certain heroes that are useful in the story and others that are just kind of weak, in my opinion. This is supposed to be the good section, but the good takeaway here is the more they could lean into that and make enemies that the heroes are uniquely fit to deal with, I think it's more interesting. It's a bit of a problem though, if your team or the community in general doesn't understand that specific heroes are kind of required to deal with certain things. That is already the case. I think 
think it's a good thing, but I also think you might find it a struggle to do harder difficulties for yourself playing with randoms, which you're forced to do in this. There's no option for single player. So if you want to really get the most fun out of it, you're probably going to need a friend group. But at the very least, another good thing, this is a good mode to try to do with friends. The banter between the characters is always appreciated, but that's kind of where the good stops for me. Everything else I would describe as jank, undercooked, underdeveloped, every aspect of it, really. But I'll elaborate more on that later. Let's try to talk about some more good things in season six. The good of season six is the new hero is really cool. Ilari overall is a positive addition for multiple reasons. Anytime a hero rewards good aim, but also doesn't seem overpowered is like a great win-win-win to me. Her time to kill isn't crazy enough to be any good until you're at the top 1%, but her weapon is competent enough that you feel like you're going to get your own big plays when your aim is on point. That's a really happy balance, and it's not like Sojourn, who sort of was giga buff to if you would aim at all, you could team wipe constantly. It's not that level. There's limits in place for her fire rate, so you're not really going to easily wipe everything unless your aim is perfect. And if your enemies have top tier aim like you do, they'll be shooting back, and I just don't think she's going to be taking over any tier of gameplay. And she just does some interesting new supportive things that we really haven't had before. Overall, new hero additions help, and now that we finally have 10 supports in the roster, the category feels complete. Like, it doesn't feel lacking anymore. There's a lot of options for you in the support role. And one cool thing I feel about heroes being added to the game, while it maybe makes the game harder to balance in some ways, it also makes the community kind of thin out a bit. Because players naturally just select different hero pools based on their own personal preference, you see different things in your games. The more heroes that are available just by the sheer fact of option selection more heroes always better i don't think i need to sell you on that idea playing as alari she's like perfectly designed to feel fun because each thing she does has such a high peak potential power the weapon damage is pretty intense and the heal numbers are insane but because it's on a limited resource with a large downtime you will have to like actually think when to use it but when you do use it it feels impactful now playing against her i think while her numbers are kind of nuts i don't I don't think there's anything she does that you'll fall victim to that feels like wow why does that even exist in the game where i think you got that impression a bit if like a kiriko randomly appears in your backline two taps your support and then tps out and you're like whoa what just happened i was just robbed like how did that occur and why is that even allowed alari's a little bit more obvious in where she'll need to position and if you're pumping damage into the tank it's like there's still a limited amount she can give the tank kind of similar to moira who's also on a resource but even more severe because I think the downtime kicks in even faster. And then if she snipes you back and hits you in the head and you didn't hit her in the head, you sort of just feel like, oh, I just got out aimed there for a two second time to kill. It's actually kind of just on par with the offensive output that supports usually have. It's been a long time since we got a new game mode. I think Flashpoint is amazing. Players don't often talk about control as a problematic game mode because we've always had much more problematic modes than control. And compared to the other ones, control had been fun, where it's a bit chaotic, you jump on point, run in circles, and there's a lot of action going on, right? But a lot of the control maps in Overwatch 1 suffer from the Overwatch 1 map philosophy of brutal choke that you can't get through. Like, think of the doorway in Sanctum, or the bridge on Lijang Gardens. Like, the whole team fight can be over just by one boop sending your team off the map. That's how they designed maps back in the day. Brutal chokes, use your teamwork, or auto-lose. And considering control is a lot about map control, once you get the point, you really can abuse those tight chokes, and it can be really annoying to try to retake any map. I mention that because the very large maps of Flashpoint and the random routes or points points that go through the map means that you'll always have a path to actually move. And if the enemy puts too much defenses in one position, you can probably go on a longer flank and set up the way you'd like to, as opposed to the map saying, nope, there's only one path for you to go, figure out how to get through this choke or die. That's really freeing in Flashpoint, and I like that a lot. I thought they might feel 
hard to track where you're supposed to go. And I will admit, sometimes the capture point is so far across the map, it's like shocking how much farther you're gonna have to run to get there. But with the indicators, it still feels pretty self-explanatory to me. But I'll be honest, I expected the mode to work well and it actually surpassed my expectations. It's really fun. Now, I'm sure the competitive community will figure out how to break the mode just like they did with Push, but I maintain that Push is still a fun mode just based on its freedom of gameplay, even if the meta is kind of solved a little too easily. For most players, I think both of these new modes fit into Overwatch 2 really well, and they're like user-friendly, and we'll have to iron out any high-level competitive issues later. Next big win in the good section. Can you believe we talked about good things for this long? I know we opened the video kind of sour, but I have a lot of good things to talk about. The player progression system is something I had wanted for such a long time, and I'm so glad it's here. Now, I'll admit, I think the graphics, images, and all that could be improved. The visual design doesn't blow me away. It's just like, okay, feels a little uninspired. Honestly, it almost feels like it comes from a different game. It's not as magical or colorful as I would expect Overwatch stuff to look, but it'll do okay for now. I'm sure they're going to improve it over time. Overall, it's just a great concept. And perhaps my favorite thing about the entire player progression system is that it shows up after the game, after you just won, or let's face it, probably lost, shows a bunch of meters going up, a bunch of tick ups of things you're accomplishing, and most importantly, plays your play of the game. Yes, those highlight intros that we don't get to see often enough, now will play every single end of game. I don't know about you, but for me anyway, that adds a lot of pleasure to playing the game because it sort of reminds me of the joy of why I'm playing to begin with. Even if I had just lost, I get the impression that you and your hero went on a journey and at least you accomplished something. And seeing the animation almost reminds me of other times I actually did get a play of the game. So it's like a emotional connecting point where the game's almost tricking me to remind me of the favorite parts I have playing the game as opposed to being depressed about the loss I just had and how badly I underperformed. Like it's not showing you your game stats, right? It's not saying like, oh, your KD went down. No, no, no. However you want to express yourself in the game, you're adding to that over time. And I think the entire concept of losses feeling less bad in Overwatch is something that they should continue to look at. And I think this is a good step forward in that regard. And then overall, over time, you'll be able to display your achievements on your player profile, customizing it to your liking. The truth is I explicitly asked for this kind of system. So of course I'm going to like it. And it's my hope that players like it as much as I do. Overall, I like seeing the numbers go up. I like them telling me, yes, indeed, you are a Torbjorn master. Keep getting out there. You crazy little dwarf. And somewhat similar to the numbers going up is slowly unlocking cosmetics through the battle pass, which I've enjoyed and I thought it was a pretty fair way to monetize, which I was surprised to find out is a controversial opinion in 2023, despite it being industry standard. So I'm a little confused on that still to this day, but due to the criticisms they've received, they have improved the battle pass over time. And I think this current one is pretty darn good. But I think more importantly is that the story missions are sort of an ad on to the battle pass, which I definitely agree makes it a snaky marketing tactic. I also think it aligns Overwatch 2 in what the vision of the game actually is, and it's into the live service game. I try to tell you guys the PVE is canceled, right? Like we get archives plus now, but I think it's archives minus. It's quite a minus because you got to pay for it, and I don't think it's a whole lot better. That's my rationale with that. As someone who already pays for the battle pass every season anyway, it doesn't hurt to shell out an extra $5 for the story missions, but it's the most dissatisfied extra $5 I've ever spent. If I was just a fan of this game and I wasn't a content creator, I wouldn't buy the next story drop next year. I'd instead read a summary of it on Wikipedia or just watch a, your Overwatch video. So overall, this battle pass section is kind of in two parts for me, where I think it's good that they keep improving the battle pass and I'm happy to keep paying it, supporting the game. They keep balancing it, adding new stuff. Seems to be a fair pipeline. I'm on board for that. The bad side is these extra add-ons of trying to milk more out of us. It's kind of lopsided. And considering that I somehow feel that $10 for a skins pack essentially is fair, yet extra $5 for archives minus isn't kind of goes to show you the relationship we have with the products that are online nowadays. The reason I feel that is because, well, skins I'll use in parts of the game I actually like. 
and archives minus is so uninspired i don't even really want to play it i tried really hard to like it and i still don't so that money is just gone as opposed to money spent on skins i might use them next year in a rotation or randomly want to throw one on or just page through in my collection like there's still value to be had for those fake digital items that are in a list somewhere that's how i feel about it and well i don't know everyone's got different opinions on how paid cosmetics work in these video games so i won't stress that point too much so part of it is in the good parts in the bad another bad that i want to add is i believe power creep is coming back to overwatch yes i want to talk about this more in a separate video as well but just in general like the stats and numbers of everything has to keep getting higher so they're making a lot of easy damage heroes even easier to compete with the higher healing stats on the healers meanwhile the roster is growing things are getting a bit more intense and the game is playing a bit more like the power creep era in overwatch one in terms of how severe some of the interactions are i'd still say the game is fun to play and is more immune to the downsides of power creep in the 5v5 format but it's definitely happening and a concern that if we don't somehow get away to like have a competitive rule set that is built for the long haul whether it's draft mode hero bands whatever I'm just a little worried because I prefer the game to be more about hero expression and individuality rather than rote meta comp theory crafting and then those aspects of the game dominate. But everybody has their own opinion on this because people were really harsh on the Sojourn era, the Widow era, the Roadhog era, and some of that I agree with, but some of it I don't agree as much. On one hand, it might feel bad if Sojourn is literally in every game in top 500. Another thing might be maybe we don't need bad Bastion to be buffed because he's never going to be a top tier pick. He shouldn't be. He's a corny mid tier pick. He's kind of a corny hero, right? Why do we need him to be top tier competitively viable? The problem is when they add buffs to these easier heroes, they tend to just dominate in the ranks that they already were good in. And I just think that's a mistake. I don't know. Maybe people like things randomly going up and down in performance, but I don't know if it's just to change up how the game plays or if they're actually trying to fix something. Are we just trying to skew win rates up and down? I'm always not really sure what the strategy is. I think the real strategy is they want to keep the game feeling fresh, but I like the game to feel fun, which I think is different than fresh. It might be refreshing for Roadhog to be meta for a season. And he was. I didn't like it. That's my own personal bias. Now on to the ugly section. Archives Minus. The three story missions that finally, after 11 years of development, release substantive story-based content to Overwatch. A huge letdown, honestly. The gameplay is the worst part. And if the gameplay was going to be so bad, I wish that they just made this a TV show or something instead. The AI opponents are terrible. I was concerned when I saw the Doomfist AI in Star Watch, and I wasn't going to assume that it was going to be the same in the story mode, but it basically is. It's like the training bots just were allowed to shoot back. I would describe it as unacceptably bad in 2023. I feel there's PS2 games that had better combat AI than this. The AI in the old, quote, PvE, and remember there's a difference between the free PvE of Archives and an actual PvE game that we expected this to be, so there's a bit of a gap in expectations there, but even compared to their old Archives events, those seem to have better scripted sequences, a better rollout of enemy types, just better altogether in every way. Like, let's compare the fluidity of the gameplay, of how cool it was for the Retribution mission as the enemy troopers were sliding down their ropes, paralleling in from the skyboxes and coming through the doors. Like, that was so much better than the story missions are. The story missions are like a door opens and they walk out in a straight line. I was shocked at how bad it was. And while going on legendary mode will make it more challenging, it's challenging in the worst possible ways where there's just more more of them and they have more health so it's just kind of boring and uneventful then on top of it i don't think the story is very good either which isn't to say that overwatch doesn't have a good story in fact i said in my why i still love overwatch after seven years video that i love the story in fact i think we can make content that can tell the story better than blizzard has been and i intend to actually let me just highlight a few things i noticed when you finish the mission and go to watchpoint gibraltar the overwatch cast are sitting around the table 
people as if they were ready for you to arrive just to say their favorite catchphrase. This is among the worst video game writing I've ever seen. It's as if a child wrote this. Like think of Toy Story, right? When Woody says, there's a snake in my boot, it's when he's a doll, not a character. The Overwatch team returns back to meet with the other Overwatch agents and they just sort of appear to say a voice line. I don't know, even for children, this isn't good. You can make things friendly for a younger audience without making it dumb. And throughout the entire story, I found it very difficult to find emotional weight. Now there was in the perspective of Ramatra, who is like an amazing character and seriously untapped potential. He is dark and menacing and the propaganda he's putting out to try to convert Omnix to his cause. It gave me flashbacks to Half-Life 2, where the big head was talking on screen to propagate the masses. It's very Big Brother 1984, all that's great. But then on the flip side, you've got a guy like Lucio who's defending his hometown, but emotionally still sounds just as excited and happy as he is at the beginning of an Overwatch match, where there's nothing at stake. He says something like, that's my favorite record store. They just burnt it down. Oh, shucks, man, that sucks. Look at this team, we're gonna do great. Like, hold on a sec. Is the Null Sector invasion a big deal or not? Is it happy-go-lucky fun time or is the world about to end? Can we have some emotional gravity to overcome? And it's not because I want it to be dark and like depressing. It's just that you actually have to commit to some emotional gravity so your characters can overcome it. And Blizzard knows this. Just watch any of the cinematics. Watch the Sojourn cinematic that they just released. It's amazing. I actually cried the first time I watched it. Or the Bastion cinematic. Or the Dragon cinematic or all of them. Why are the cinematics so much better? But the storytelling in the game is horrifically bad. Like it's so bad that I'm curious if they will actually cancel the rest of it, which is a huge letdown for me. What, what is good about it, I suppose, is like the character interactions between the characters, the quips and voice lines and the depth of the characters as they exist was always good. It was good in the pre-game buildup in your PvP matches as well. Those voice line interactions have been a home run hit for the game. But you can't have an entire story of just that, of just like funny quips between the characters. That's not really a universe. And the reason why I say all this is because even if they had the endlessly replayable RPG part of the game, it wouldn't make any of this better. Having special talent trees and more progression to grind out this would not have improved it. So it's no surprise that they cut that. I just had hoped that them cutting that scope of it meant that the thing that they were actually keeping was gonna be good, and it's not. I know it's been up and down with emotion, but of course, that's what we get as Overwatch fans. We never get everything that we want. Our relationship to Overwatch is kind of like growing up with a toxic single mother. And when we ask her for more food because we're starving, she says, you're so annoying, this is why dad left. And in the analogy, dad is Papa Jeff. Well guys, that's everything for today's video. If you did enjoy it, please be sure to leave it with a like and don't forget to hit subscribe and click the bell icon to actually get notified when our videos come out. That's been it for me. I've been Frito for your Overwatch. I'll see you guys next time.